This episode of Baseball Bits is brought to you by The Athletic. For the best baseball coverage you can find, use my link at theathletic.com slash foolishbaseball for a 30-day free trial as well as 50% off your annual subscription. In 2019, Jeff Mathis had a 158 batting average, 209 on base percentage, and 224 slugging percentage for the Texas Rangers. He made very little contact, struck out 35% of the time, barely walked, and didn't hit for power. Among hitters with at least 200 plate appearances, he finished with the lowest OPS in the league, making him the least productive hitter in Major League Baseball. The Rangers had brought Mathis in on a two-year contract the previous offseason. He was to serve as the replacement for the recently departed Robinson Chirinos, who became a free agent after his option was declined. Chirinos would go on to have a career year as the primary catcher for the Houston Astros, while Mathis floundered at the plate. So, the Rangers rectified the situation by bringing Chirinos back this past offseason. GM John Daniels even admitted that cutting Chirinos was a mistake. And, with fellow catcher Jose Trevino also under contract, it would seem that Jeff Mathis' time in Texas, and possibly Major League Baseball, was over. Not so fast. At the Chirinos press conference, Daniel stated that he expects Chirinos and Jeff Mathis as the catching tandem on opening day. Jeff Mathis has long been the worst hitter in baseball, but teams still want him on their rosters. When he plays in 2020, it will somehow be his 16th season in the majors. This is the player that defies most analytics. This is the catcher that can't hit. This is the unstoppable career of Jeff Mathis. In order to understand just how historically awful Jeff Mathis has been at hitting, we need a stat that can compare players across different eras and run environments. Even the juice ball of 2019 created much different offensive stats compared to 2014. In this case, I'll be using OPS+. Plus. Now, OPS, you should know, it's simply on-base plus slugging. On-base gives you the rate at which a batter reaches base, and slugging gives you the rate at which a batter accrues bases. Combine the two, and you have a solid surface level batting stat. The purpose of the plus in OPS Plus is to put everyone on an equal playing field by adjusting for the run scoring environment. In OPS Plus, the league average is always 100, so it gives you the opportunity to compare hitters in different situations. Right now, you're looking at the 5 best hitters all time by career OPS Plus. Looks like a good list if you ask me. Here's another example. George Springer had a 150 OPS Plus last season. That would imply he was 50% better than the average hitter. OPS Plus can adjust for park factors and the offensive era that you played in, but it can adjust for, well, you know. On the other side of 100, something like an 80 OPS Plus would be quite poor, and beyond that, 60 OPS Plus would be mostly unsuitable for the major league level. This leads to my invention, the Mathis. The Mathis is simple, 200 or more plate appearances and an OPS Plus of 60 or lower in a single season. It's a test of a baseball team's patience. How often does a major league team give extended opportunities to really bad hitters? The namesake himself, Jeff Mathis, has achieved the Mathis eight times in his career. No other active player has managed to do it more than twice. 16 players Mathis in 2019, but Mathis was the most Mathis-y of them all, with an OPS Plus of 11, the worst in Major League Baseball. His 2019 was also record-breaking. By earning his 8th Mathis, he became the all-time leader in post-integration Mathises. It's a beautiful sight. Hall of Famers who Mathis at some point in their careers include Ozzie Smith, Carlton Fisk, and Alan Trammell. But those all came at the beginning or end of their careers. Jeff Mathis has Mathis at all ages and for four different ball clubs. He even Mathis in Arizona, became a free agent, and earned a two-year deal with the Rangers. So, how does such a poor hitter keep getting these opportunities? It's because catching is hard, and Jeff Mathis is really good at it. In terms of evaluating a player's total value to a team, there exists something called the defensive spectrum. The idea is that playing a difficult position like shortstop at an average level is more valuable than being an average defender at a so-called easy position like first base. Because of this, a first baseman would be expected to shoulder the load more offensively, and that tracks with the baseball of today. This is probably the era with the most offensively talented shortstops we have ever seen, but the first baseman as a whole still hit better than them. According to both the Fangraphs positional adjustments and Bill James, who invented the spectrum in the first place, catcher is the hardest defensive position on the diamond. 
That's also unsurprising. Not only is catcher physically demanding, it also relies on the ability to work with a pitcher and think strategically. Catchers can also help their pitchers through the act of framing. Framing is a really nice word that really means lying to umpires. Through smart positioning of their glove and perhaps a click flick of the wrist, the wrist, a catcher can turn a ball into a strike. Historically, Jeff Mathis has been extremely good at framing. If I were you, I would start getting your alibi straight because Jeff Mathis could probably frame you for murder if he wanted to. Tracking catcher framing is a new phenomenon in the sabermetric world, but baseball prospectus is generally agreed upon as having the most advanced framing metrics. Throughout his career, Jeff Mathis has saved an estimated 93.8 runs from scoring just from his framing alone. His 2018 campaign, which was the contract year in Arizona, was his best framing season on record, as he led all of Major League Baseball in framing runs above average despite finishing 37th in total catcher innings. Jeff Mathis has organized more strikes than the labor movement. Planning to run on Jeff Mathis? That has proven to be a tricky endeavor as well. From 2013 to 2018, Mathis threw out runners at a rate well above the league average, and that's part of why the Rangers were willing to give a two-year deal to an unproductive hitter. Jeff Mathis makes pitchers better. Let's talk about that. Before his time with the Diamondbacks, Mathis spent four seasons with the Miami Marlins where he developed a bond with the young phenom, Jose Fernandez. After throwing eight shutout innings against the Padres in 2013, Fernandez pointed out that he only shook off Mathis' suggested pitch once in the entire game, and that's only because he wanted to throw a changeup before it was over. That telepathic connection proved to be valuable to young Fernandez, who put up unbelievable rookie numbers with Mathis as his battery mate. Fernandez would later go on to pitch very well with another talented catcher in JT Realmuto, but it was Mathis who first unlocked Fernandez's potential in his legendary 2013 rookie campaign. That expertise didn't just apply to young pitchers. Mathis became the preferred catcher for Zach Greinke during his time in Arizona. The pairing made sense, as Granke could actually help make up for Mathis's production in the lineup. This isn't even an exaggeration, Zach Granke is a better hitter than Jeff Mathis. Then it was on to Texas. A disaster of a season, right? Maybe if you just look at the offensive numbers, but the Rangers also produced two top 10 Cy Young finishes from, ready, Lance Lynn and Mike Miner? Seriously? No offense, but those guys? Mathis played in 86 games as a Ranger, just over half of the total 162, but he caught 50 of the 65 combined starts from Lynn and Miner, who put up career years with Mathis as their battery mate. Looking at catcher ERA isn't always the best tool, but the fact of the matter is that wherever Jeff Mathis goes, good pitching performances follow. Make Jose Fernandez great? Fine, he was uber talented. Make Zach Granke great? Zach Granke just is great. But make Mike Miner and Lance Lynn great? Those guys aren't scrubs, but I still think Jeff Mathis might be working some sort of black magic to pull this off. This skill has always been valued by ball clubs, and that's perhaps best illustrated by the Napoli Mathis Convergence. This is the Napoli Mathis Convergence. It's a story within a story. The year was 2010. Mike Trout was in the process of becoming one of the top prospects in baseball, but this story isn't about him. It's about two catchers. Two catchers by the names of Mike Napoli and Jeff Mathis. They were teammates on the 2010 Angels, and they were polar opposites. While Jeff Mathis was Mathising, Mike Napoli could seriously hit. Among catchers in Major League Baseball, he finished with the highest isolated power and most home runs. Jeff Mathis, meanwhile, finished with the lowest OPS. As you can imagine, it was a different story defensively. Napoli was never a natural behind the plate, and Angels pitchers had an ERA over 5 pitching to him. Jeff Mathis, however, worked some of that sweet Jeff Mathis black magic with the exact same pitching staff. This left the Angels with a question that wasn't just practical, it was also philosophical. Keep the sure bat of Mike Napoli, or keep the wizardry of Jeff Mathis? War, at least Fangraphs and Baseball References versions, would tell you that this question was a no-brainer, as Napoli appeared the superior player according to that particular metric. So while sabermetric wisdom said it was better to tolerate Napoli's defensive shortcomings rather than Mathis' bat, the Angels chose the opposite. Napoli was shipped out of town to acquire Vernon Wells. It ended up being a really bad trade for the Angels. Napoli ended up being traded to the Rangers, and he put together some good seasons for them, and he was even able to transition into a first baseman designated hitter type because his bat was really good. He even won a World Series as the Red Sox primary first baseman in 2013. 
Mathis stayed in Los Angeles for another year, but Mathis also remains a catcher at age 37, while Napoli stopped catching at age 30 and was out of the league at age 35. Was trading Napoli the right move? Eh, certainly not for Vernon Wells, but it did show that Jeff Mathis has hard to measure skills that teams value, and that still goes on to this day, nine years after the Napoli-Mathis convergence. The two are even close friends, with Napoli describing Mathis as a great teammate who teaches young guys how to play the game correctly. Perhaps this quote just confirms what we knew about Mathis all along. He's far more than numbers on a baseball reference page. Can we really understand Jeff Mathis? I don't think Jeff Mathis can be assessed by basic sabermetrics. Baseball Reference has him at below replacement level for his entire career, while Fangraphs and Prospectus with their framing metrics have him as above replacement level, but not a particularly impactful player. Yet, he's entering the 16th year of his MLB career. If he plays in 2020, that will tie him with Henry Blanco for the most seasons by a sub-replacement level catcher post-integration. Those numbers are driven by his generally unproductive hitting. In the integration era, he has the worst OPS plus among players with as many plate appearances as he does, meaning that he's the worst modern hitter with his longevity. But more than those negative numbers, Jeff Mathis is good for baseball. He makes the players around him better, and he has inspired some of the best player analysis you can read on the internet. His career encouraged new statistics for catcher framing, but also serves as a reminder that not everything in baseball can be measured. And he's unstoppable. Seriously, a 200 on base percentage in 2019 can't stop him. He's still set up for a role in 2020. And I'm sure Lance Lynn and Mike Miner are very thankful for that. Jeff Mathis's day of reckoning will come. It comes for all the greats. But even the end of Jeff Mathis's playing days won't be the end of his baseball career. If he wants to stick around, I imagine he'll become quite the attractive candidate for coaching jobs. He just probably won't be a hitting coach. This episode of Baseball Bits was brought to you by The Athletic. The Athletic provides its readers with the best baseball coverage and storytelling available. They employ a world-class team of writers that cover all your favorite organizations at the local level as well as at the league level, and that goes for almost any sport you can imagine. On top of this, the website and app are completely ad-free, so no more annoying pop-ups. You can use my link at theathletic.com slash foolishbaseball for 50% off your yearly subscription as well as a 30-day free trial. Once again, thank you to The Athletic for sponsoring this episode of Baseball Bits.